what throws me is why I'm on page 27 from the beginning of the unit nine, and you're on page 21. That's but we are on the same page. Unit nine, nine yeah. Holes. Holes. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, now it's no, I'm on 27. Oh, let's see. No, I don't know. Not sure. Okay, so we're going to start with Unit 9 today. Um, some of you guys have been submitting scholarship forms. I love you for that. Please continue to do that. I saw a couple of them pop up. So I don't necessarily see names, but I just see three scholarships to review. And I'm going to tell you, I am soft when it comes to scholarships. Ten is the highest you can get. I always just go in there and I'm like ten for everybody. So you, I mean, even if it's in crayon, which would be really hard to do. That's what we were just talking about, right? Yes, scholarships, yeah. So make sure that you've got your scholarship submitted. If I don't see enough, there should be about 25 submissions. Um, if I don't see 25 submissions in the next couple of days, I will go down to the office, try to figure out whose names who have not submitted the scholarships, and I will hunt you down. Um, on the main page uh, for State Fair, kind of down, down towards the bottom, probably in the finance section, um, like where, uh, you know, pay your bill kind of thing, probably scholarship. That's, it's at the bottom on the left-hand side, I think. So get that filled out, and then we'll go from there. Um, our camera is going now, so all classes will be recorded, and that's a great thing because that way if you forget something, that we covered in class, you can go back to the video as we put it on the YouTube channel and then we'll link it to the module that is in as well. So that way if you have a problem. If something happens, you uh, wrecked your motorcycle this weekend and um, you're in a full body cast for the next week, then um, all you get is a week. Yeah, I need you back after that. So um, you're going to have to just heal, take your vitamins. So, um, what's that? Show up in the body cast. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure what to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was with you. I was with you halfway through that. Um, but yeah, so if you miss a class for being sick or whatever, uh, if COVID gets you, whatever, you know, kind of thing, if you miss a class, you can still watch the class and still get caught back up on it. So it'll be just that, maybe not that same day, hopefully that same day that it'll be up, and then that way you should be able to stay along with what we're doing. So, um, Following in metrology, we are um, kind of echoing uh, or mirroring some of the same things that we're doing in the morning with PMI. Um, today we're going to start talking about holes and hole measurements and how we identify the holes um, and just some of that stuff. So let's look at just a couple of the key terms. Blind holes, anybody know what a blind hole is? Can you describe to me what a blind hole is? Yes. It's a hole where it, it stops halfway through the park or at a specific Right, it does not go through. Whatever you call it. Right, yeah. Not a through hole. Not a through hole is <laughs> excellent. That is a great definition of that. Okay. Um, what's a bolt circle? Anybody know what a bolt circle is? Bolt or circles. Bolt hole pattern would be that. Yeah. So circles or holes in a in a round pattern around something. Yeah. Evenly spaced, somewhat not necessarily evenly spaced, but oftentimes evenly spaced. Um, boring would be just the process of making a hole that is um, precision in size. Counter boring, counter drilling, and counter sinking. So counter boring and counter drilling would be pretty similar. Um, so it's a larger cylinder on top of a smaller cylinder. So something for like a socket cap screw to go down into, uh, that would be a counter bore. Counter sink would be something for like a flathead to go into. So it's Taper, uh, either 90 degrees, 82 degrees, something along that line. Head goes down into it, and typically it's a socket head as well. Um, drill or drilling, just hole making. Um, reamer or reaming would be um, kind of taking that final size. So if you need a hole that's 375 precision, that's deep, it's unborable. Um, and you can't EDM it or do some other function like that. You typically drill it. Uh, a percentage of the hole smaller and then bring it out with a reamer. So it's a, it's a drilling tool. Spot facing would be creating a flat face before a hole so that a bolt can sit down on there. Through hole is exactly what it says. It's a hole that goes through. 
So um, pretty straightforward on most of those things. Um, just a piece of information for you guys. I don't know if you know or care. If you're a Mastercam follower and a Sandvik lover, Sandvik just bought out Mastercam, which was mind-blowing to me. So Sandvik is an insert and materials company. And they also do a lot of mining. Um, so I like Minecraft, but actual mine. Um, and then, the, so they just bought out Mastercam. So I'm curious to see Mastercam with CAM program or for Gary machine or manufacturing. Um, I mean, I'm anxious to see what that would be like. If you're not a machining nerd, then none of that matters to you. So um, it does to me. All right, so here is a kind of a, a general look at a hole designation. You've got your hole there. You've got your center point. Um, you get this cross section there. It kind of like a target. It identifies the center of the hole. Uh, you have a leader line. Leader line is a common um, description for um, just getting to some information about uh, what that feature is. You have your diameter symbol, so a circle with a line through it. You have your hole size in diameter. Um, if it's radius, it'll be, it'll be an R or some other type of uh, symbol. Uh, then, then what you want to do is look here, so you got two places beyond the decimal point. You want to look back to your title block, see what that tolerance is. That says through. Uh, I know it doesn't spell the entire word, but it does tell you what it is doing. Um, and so that's pretty that's pretty common uh, for what you're going to see for just a, a single hole. Um, again, if you wanted to, uh, depending on how, if you're on the design side of life and you are looking for those things, ASME Y14.5 standard um, is going to cover most of the stuff that you need. Um, sometimes prints will go in and out of that. So if you're not ISO and you're not following um, ASME standards, then it's not that big of a deal. Um, or if you're working off of older prints. So what's the so people who are working in a shop, what's the oldest print that you've ever worked off of? You guys have probably worked on some older parts from Waterloo, yeah. right? Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, you don't look at those things when you get them. That's the first thing I look at, man. Ours don't even have titles. Yeah, a lot of ours don't even have titles. Okay, so yeah. And now that that happens a lot, especially if it's a shop-made print. Um, the problem with that, though, is is it does it, it starts to make things vague. So like if it was made by your boss, designer, engineer, two hours before that, all that information is fresh. But five years from now, you guys might have all won the lottery or uh, apparently bought Dogecoin, which which would have got you some money, um, then you would, you may not be there, and, you, and those things may not be as fresh in people's minds anymore. So, um, what's the oldest print that you've ever seen? I know we looked here recently, recently, the Grand Lexington Park one, the uh, yeah, not really. yeah, a couple of weeks late 90s, okay. starting to get older. I think the oldest park I've ever worked on was like 1946. Well, that says a lot about a part, man. It's not that I'm that old. I mean, I know you guys know that I'm 25. But um, so, but like, what's cool about that is that whoever made that part in 1946 must have been pretty good, because it not a lot of changes to it, right? So not a lot of revisions that went through it, um, and you know, I mean, I'm sure a few revisions have went along the way, but um, I mean, it, it says a lot about the part. So. When you see old prints like that, they're oftentimes not going to have things like GBT. Uh, they're not going to follow ASME um, Y14.5 standard because none of those things existed at that time. We just got out of World War II, you know what I mean? So um, a lot of that stuff just it's just not going to matter. It wasn't, didn't exist. All right, so here we're just kind of adding on to what you have there. Um, instead of going through, we've got a whole depth and then a depth symbol. So this little shovel-looking thing. Um, is the depth of the hole, it is 5 eighths of an inch deep, so 625. Normally, on a hole like that, it leads us into two possible scenarios when we're drilling a hole. If we're drilling a hole that has a drill point, so the, the drill has a point on it, like that, you've got this area that you need to make a decision about what you're doing. Is it asking you 625? Full diameter, so this is 625 here to here. This is not. Um, is it saying I want to go 625 full hole? 
or is it 625 to the tip? Um, if you had to guess, what would you think that it would be? To the tip. To the tip. I heard another couple to the tip. I would say full diameter hull. Um, so my assumption would be that there is a pin or something going in there, and I need to go um, so that I can get that 625 diameter pin, if it's two inches long, all the way down flush or something like that. But you, you could absolutely be right on what you're talking about. If the part, so say it's 625 deep, um, and so say we go um, our drill tip, let's just say it's 100 thousandths. If our part is only 700 thousandths, um, and then it's probably to the tip because that would break through, and then we would no longer have, we'd have a, a through hole. And, and having a hole that breaks through when it's not supposed to break through, pretty big deal. So that's one of those things that you want to question, um, hey, what is going on? That's why it's so important to review the print before you get started. My morning class uh, 135 is getting ready to build this pretty intricate um, chest set. It's got a ton of four axis and three plus two. And I, I gave him the prints today and I said, hey, you need to be looking at these prints so that Monday you're ready to get started on it. Very rarely are you super efficient when you get the print and start on the part. You want to get the print, take some time to review the print, know what's on the print, and get going. What you don't want to have happen is um, you've got this whole 70 diameter, 625 deep, and you're going to go, and, and next thing you know, you're like, oh my gosh, I don't have the right size drill. Well, you're two-thirds of the way through it, and it's midnight now. Well, if you would have started that, when you started that party at noon, probably could have got the drill that you needed. But now the tool crib guy's gone, all the stores are closed, and, and now what do you do? If you need the part for production tomorrow, you're, you're kind of in a, in a pickle. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to everything that you need. Sometimes you'll get um, uh, like a tool sheet or a setup sheet that says, this is what you need. This is what you'll do, but not always, especially if you're in your toolmaker row like this, um, where you guys are working on one thing at a time. You're not gonna, you're not setting up a job to run for days. You're gonna make that one die shoe. You're gonna make that one repair part, um, and and the plan is that it's back into production for tomorrow. So you wanna make sure that you have the things that you need. So typically for you guys, um, as soon as you get the print, what's the first thing that you look for? Make sure everything's there. Make sure everything's there on the print. Yes. Okay, size. So dimensions on the print and um, how big is this part? Whether I have the material for it or not. Whether you have the material for it or not. There's nothing worse than searching the shop for three hours and you're like, I need this piece of D2. That's what I think. Nah, don't have that. And so then you may have to do some type of supplement material, so substitution material. So. All right, so yeah, just really making a plan. And that, I think that translates for everything in life. Um, who's made a cake? May ever make a cake? Okay. Anybody want to bring a cake in Monday? Um, that'd be great. Um, so there's nothing worse than, so I don't know how to make a cake, but I know how to make pancakes. It's got cake in the word, right? So um, uh, flour, a little salt, a little sugar, uh, baking powder, baking soda, some eggs, some milk, um, or you can get the pancake mix and just, you know, water and you're done. Um, but there's nothing worse than going through those steps and being like, Ah, I don't have flour. And so you've mixed your baking soda, your baking powder, your eggs, your salt, your sugar, all that together. And now what are you going to do with it? Throw it away, right? So it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Having that plan, that's going to translate in life. If in two weeks you're like, I don't want a machine. I love the teacher, but I hate the class. Um, then you might leave and want to go do something else. It's the same pattern. Everything in life you want to start to kind of know what it is that you're doing there so okay um looking at this next one here's a whole pattern so this pattern appears to be evenly spaced um you have your number of holes so nine x so nine times I means there's going to be nine holes on there hole diameter is 375 or what is that in a fraction three eighths okay so it's three eighths diameter holes and there are nine of them on there. We can assume that it's centered, okay, so it's centrally located, and it's equally spaced. But other than that, we really don't know anything else about it. 
uh, we ought to know the spacing of the holes. So if it doesn't say that it is equally spaced or centered, but it appears to be, then we, we can usually assume that that's what it is. Okay, so a couple different ways that we can identify on top views that our hole is uh, in there. Diameter, 468, just leader line to the hole. Next, we have a diameter, you know, stretch it across the diameter, 468, and then you have top and bottom, 468 through. Your front view is dashed, so those are hidden lines telling you that, that you should still be able to, you should not be able to see this part or this hole from the outside, but if you were to cut this thing through a section, then you should be able to see it. Um, when you have a round part, you should only have to see two views of it. You shouldn't need a front, front top, and a right side. You should just need two views should take care of the part, unless it's extremely intricate. All right. Um, again, 625, 875 deep. 875 is what in a fraction? Somebody else? 7 eighths. 7 eighths. Okay. How much? 7 eighths. Wait, which number? 875. Okay. <laughs> oh, those are 6 points. Yep. Um, okay, so here is blind hole. And if you'll look at this dimension, 875, it's showing you 875 on a full depth of, of hole. Okay. Um, but it's not to say it's always like that. So it's always good to ask the question. Uh, so just like one of those questions that it always, or one of those statements that it keeps telling us in PMI, um, you need to, when in doubt, ask the question. You know, I mean, for me, um, like, my whole job is to answer questions for you. So don't, don't just assume, oh, he probably wants us to use this. Just, like, ask the question. Same thing in work. Don't don't just make assumptions on what it is that you're supposed to do. Somebody beside you, around you, probably knows the process of the things that you're making, or uh, they've done it before, and they can help you out. So you want to utilize those people. Uh, when I was kind of doing, we didn't really have an official apprenticeship, but when we did, when I kind of grew up through the shop, I worked next to this guy who was probably 600 years old at the time, and I would just always lean over and be like, Don, am I, what, am I doing it all right? He'd be like, a little faster, a little slower, speed up a little feet, a little, feet, a little faster on feet, a little slower on feet. Just, you just kind of lean over and tell me, you know, like, you should have been with that done with that like three hours ago. Like, okay, wish you would have told me that sooner. And so I just hustle on through the park. You know, he just kind of helped me along so I'd know what was, was necessary. So you want to ask a lot of questions. Here's two bolt circles, four times. 328, that's the diameter of the holes. Um, and then we have a bolt hole circle, but it doesn't really tell us what the bolt circle is. Okay. So here we have 312 or 516, three holes, still equally spaced, all at 120 degrees. Okay. So you might see them in a couple different ways whenever you're looking at them. And really looking at the print, especially for you 101s, um, when you start on parts next week, um, this is probably the first time that you're going to have seen some part prints. And it can be super overwhelming. Our first couple parts are super simple. I mean, they are practically crayon. And, but then they get progressively harder. So you want to really get that kind of overview of what's going on. So Clint and I talked about that this morning. And uh, he's like, man, he's like, those guys are going to hate those hacksaw saw parts. I was like, I know. So they're making big cheese like cleaners out with total hacksaw. Yeah. But, but, I, in being so gracious, I made them out of aluminum. I know. So nice. But, like, you guys had to make yours out of steel, right? You guys make them. That's a fan saw. Fan saw. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, hacksaw and aluminum. I mean, yeah. I had to make ours. Fan saw, like, still counts, though. Fan saw still counts, yeah. Because, like, trying to, like, hold it. And, like, right. Get in there. Control. Yeah. The, the hacksaw is going to suck like 10 pounds worse. Yeah. Yeah. But it's got to be great for starting to get some of that control. The yeah. hacksaw is pretty handy sometimes. The hacksaw makes a huge difference sometimes, yeah. and that's really why it's got a little flexible blade sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you can kind of get a little twist, get a little yeah. English on that thing, get in the spot that you want. All right, so let's look at some round parts. I'm going to pop that up just a little bit higher. All right, so. Um, front view and a side view for round parts. They don't need a top view because they look just the same as the other one. This has a 1.148 bore that runs through. Dash line needs a hidden line so we can see both of these things are the same thing on there. Here we have a uh, two specifications on there. 
you're going to drill it 562. What's that in a fraction? Don't be afraid to use a calculator or one of those little cards. 916. And um, don't be afraid to just blurt out something wrong. We'll all make fun of you. And, um, and so, but yeah, getting those things are going to be really important. So you're going to drill through, and then it tells you the reamer size. Sometimes you get the reamer size. Sometimes there is an assumption that you know what the drill size should be for the reamer. So it might say 375 plus or minus one ream through, and then <laughs> you're supposed to know that you need to find a drill that's about 10 to 15 thousand smaller than that. Now, if you are, are, are new, sometimes you're asking a person beside you or around you, machinery handbook is gonna be able to give you some of those sizes. It's not always a specific size, it's almost always really a percentage of the, the distance because as the hole gets bigger, it, it changes things. So you end up with a finished hole of 578. It's not always 10 to 15 thou. It's not always 10 to 15 thou. No, because that wouldn't make sense on a 62 thousandths hole because it'd be so much percentage. It also wouldn't work if your hole would be 14 inches. You see what I'm saying? So it's really need to be a percentage of the hole. Yeah, um, and I think uh, we get into a habit of about 10 to 15 thousandths because that fits for most of our parts. That probably fits from quarter inch to half inch. You know, that's probably in that range of that. Um, but anything more than that, yeah, you really want to go to the book and figure out exactly what you need to have for that. Um, counter boring. So counter bore has this 90 degree shoulder on the bottom. Um, so a bolt, socket cap screw style bolt, might sit down inside of that, uh, or a spring pocket or something. So this little U shape is the uh, telling you that it's getting a depth. So you've got um, 438, you've got 880, and you've got 380. And so what's that? That's telling me I'm going 438 all the way through. Okay, I'm going 880 diameter to a depth of 380 shovel and and so these are saying the same thing just two ways of seeing it okay sometimes on a socket head cap screw um, typically the head i think it's the head diameter is the same as the head depth um, but you always want to go just a little bit deeper on that depth so you get that make sure you get that bolt below the surface okay so so say that the socket head cap screw is maybe 316, and let's just say the head is 500, it's probably bigger than that. Um, you want to go maybe 510 deep on there, because you want to make sure that that doesn't catch as something goes across it. Same thing with a flathead. A flathead needs to sit below the surface. Um, what I would do is I, is I start to work, if, I, if I'm working in a shop, I would start my own little bolt collection. And so like if you use, if you use a common bolt, um, or you got to go to the tool crib and get, hey, I need five flatheads, and you go get those bolts. You really only need four. You stick that one in your box. That way you can use it as a gauge for the next time that you use it, and that just just keeps you from having to go back and forth. Now, sometimes you want to use when you're gauging those head depths. You want to use some type of a chamber gauge to make sure that you've got it right. But for the most part, for most of the stuff that we do, we just need to make sure that that surface, maybe that bolt is below the surface that we're sliding on or mounting to or sitting on. Okay, here are counter sinks. So 82 degree included angle for um, a counter sunk bolt. Uh, here it's five or 450 and then 724 at that top diameter and then 82 degrees. And so sometimes there are actual gauges that you can bring it down, set it on there, make sure that it's right but not always. Um, sometimes you would just caliper measure that. Um, you can do the math for that, but typically you're gonna be okay uh, just running calipers over and, and moving on. Um, so here's just slightly different, 724, countersink down there, it looks like 120. Um, it's got a counter bore attached to it. I'm not sure, uh, I can guess I can maybe see using that for something, just to make sure that it's seated down below it. Here's a spot face. Spot face is when you have this, say the surface is rough, it's cast, or it's, it's hot roll, it's, it's inconsistent. 
And all you're looking for is a good flat surface across here so that when you bottom your bolt out that you're getting minimum 80% cleanup on there. So you don't necessarily have to have 100% cleanup on it, 100% is great, but you're just trying to get a solid base. What happens if you don't have a solid base? So uh, the top of the surface that you're bolting to is rough. You're going to run the bolt all the way down, but the surface is inconsistent. What can happen? See properly, you could bend the bolt. Yeah, you could bend the bolt. It won't see properly. Could cause the part to move, shift. Just trying not to say cock. Um, yeah, I think probably more than anything, it, it, it has a tendency that when it doesn't get down to where it's got really good gripping strength, it's got the potential to loosen up. So. You could definitely do that, and safety wire is a great thing, but um, if you don't have to use it, well, let's not use it, yeah. So, but I mean, if you've got, if you've got a washer and a lock washer, you got all those things in there, you got good uh, machine surfaces on there, yeah, absolutely, that's what you want to do. Now, safety wire with bolts, socketed cap screws, or whatever your bolts are with holes going through them and safety wire, that's absolutely a real thing, and there's plenty of opportunities where you're going to use well, safety wire. Everything, even peanuts on it. Safety wire. Yeah. Everything that tightens the bolts. Yeah. On how safety yeah, and that makes My sense. My favorite was uh, the two main bolts in front of the A10's gun. You have about that much room to safety wire. Yeah. Even on the. So imagine. Uh, yep. Where you got? You yeah. Don't have to point the wall. Because then you're yeah. stuck. Imagine you got a ball hole circle like this. Let's just assume it's the wheel for your Durango. Um, so Durango. G. Oh yeah, chair, 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 so uh, standard, 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 yes. uh, standard is a max three bolts. Standard is a maximum three bolts. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. I don't guess I've ever really seen. Yeah, I have not Yeah, that makes um, sense, though. it totally makes sense. I mean, especially on something that spins, um, just some type of maximum force or potential to. Um, you know, come undone. You know, right. kind of vibration. Yep. vibration. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the Air Force mechanics put things together. You know, so but yeah, uh, it's it's a smart idea, really. I mean, it's we would say most of the time it's overkill, and it probably is overkill. But the time that it's not is awesome. You know what I mean? The time where you're like, oh my gosh, I think I forgot to tighten that bolt. Safety wire held it on because it, it linked to all these other ones. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's really a pretty good deal. I mean, because I've, I've put wheels on a car and then been driving down the road and going, oh, I, I, I got to stop. I think I got a problem. Um, so, all right. Okay. Counter our spot faces cover. And when I was 16, I did that and lost my wheel. Did you really? Nope. I have never. First car I've ever changed. <laughs> no kidding. Nope. Um, Just didn't get it tight enough. I have never had one come off. I have one, I've had one come loose. When my middle son was driving to New Mexico, first time he'd ever driven out of state, kind of on his own, um, we had done a bunch of work to his car before he left, and he had a wheel come off. And when it did it, it stripped out. No, no, no. It did not come off. It, um, he kept hearing this, you know, as he would speed up and slow down, he's like, what is going on? And, um, and so it's like that thing where you're like, you're, just you've almost got it figured out and then you're like oh my gosh i should have stopped a long time ago and so he didn't come off but he comes back there and there are two lug nuts holding it on and they are just barely holding it on everything else is just stripped off or just chewed up and he calls me he's like what do i do i said here's what i would do so i would tighten those babies down and i would drive 
and I would just I would just take it nice and easy the rest of the way. I said, "What do you got to go?" He's like, "Like a hundred miles." I was like, "I'd go for it," and he's like, "I am not going for it." And so they towed him in the rest of the way and put new studs on it. Um, you just screw the factory torque settings. Just torque that. Torque that's what I would do. I would I would be I would be under the assumption that I'm going to change out all those studs the next day, and I would just crank that baby down. We're going for it, man. I go give me three vice grips, just clamp them down on the wheel and just drive. You know? well. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but he is a lot smarter than I am, and he's like, nah, I think I'm not gonna risk it, you know. And I mean, he said, he goes, all I could think of was seeing. You ever had a wheel pass you? Yeah, I've had a wheel pass. <laughs> I've seen that. Yeah, I had a wheel pass me on a with a, on a trailer one day, and I was like, I got a wheel. Dang it, that is my wheel. You know. <laughs> so yeah, you want to make sure you're, you're watching on stuff like that. So. I definitely raced them down there, like back in, I think it was like May. And he broke like all the wheel stuff, so I just had one wheel stuff on. No all. kidding. It was like, yeah, I started to go yeah. like this because it was like right it shift in there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean that's a that's a huge thing. If there's any place to put safety wire, those are probably the places to put them. All right, um, let's do a quick unit review on this one. And remember, as we're going through this, this is kind of a flyover on all this stuff. We'll continue to dig down on these things. We've got 16 weeks to go through prints and parts, and we'll continue to get deeper involved in this. True or false? The ASME. Uh, Y145 standard recommends using words instead of symbols for, for specifying dimensions. False. 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 That is absolutely true. I started seeing that, and really, that's that's it. It actually makes sense, but I didn't think it made sense for a while. So I went to Fanuc and did some training at Fanuc one time, and not 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 long ago, a couple years, and they said they had their peach pendant that we were working with because we were doing the robot. And they said, yeah, in two years, you'll see no more words on these things anymore. And I was like, what? He's like, yeah, we're eliminating all words from any of the teach pendants. He's like, now, words will be across the screen, but no buttons will have words. And I was like, what are you, why? And he's like, because America is not the only place in the world. And I was like, what? But, I mean, he's like, because we have them in Sweden, in France, in Japan. Uh, we, have, we got robots everywhere. He goes, and if we can say... Red triangle, yellow square, running man, you know, whatever the symbol was, he's like, anybody knows those things. And I was like, that's actually a pretty good idea. And so when they started using different things, like, so just for a counterboard, I've seen it where it says counterboard, where it says seaboard, um, where it has the symbol. I and mean, I probably can tell you five or six different ways to describe the counterboard. I know that. Because I've been machining since before some of you guys were alive, but you don't. And you need to be able to, from day one, to be able to know what it is that you're supposed to do from the beginning. And using some of that symbology really helps. Um, I would not, I'm not recommending trying to memorize the ASME Y14, it's huge. But, um, but using symbols rather than um, words is a huge help for us. Blank is the common, is the most common machining operation. Drilling, yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody's drilled a hole, right? Exactly. You can't. It's it's hard to ream a hole if it's not pre-drilled. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could do it if you really, really. Oh my gosh, you could do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you've got to you've got to have that done. And so, like I said, everybody's drilled a hole, even if it's with a cordless drill, you know, somewhere. You know, and cordless drills, they can get you. Especially when they come out the back side of the hole, you know. I mean, I about knocked myself out a couple times. Sheet metal. Yeah, sheet metal. Oh my gosh, wrist breaker, man. I mean, that thing. Like you can't, you can't hold on, or you got it like this, and you're like trying to hold it, and oh my gosh, this thing's good. I, I like to drill almost all the way through, and I'm like, hey Jack, can you finish this up? And I go somewhere else. And he's like, oh my gosh, my wrist. Um, okay, blank is a circular center line um, used to locate holes in a hole pattern. Is it B? It is B. True or false? Boring produces a straight round hole more accurately than by drill. I would say true. Sure, absolutely. 
Yeah, um, so bullwarring is using that consistent uh, cutter or cutters uh, to create a nice, smooth hole. I mean, imagine just on an engine. Imagine if those if those cylinder bores were drilled. I mean, that'd be ridiculous, right? Like they just wouldn't be. They wouldn't. They wouldn't do what they were supposed to do. You I mean, imagine your ring going up and down in a hole that was just drilled. I mean, it was just really just little start up for the yeah. drill pulling back out. Yeah. I mean, it just pop rings off on the way down, and then you know, have no problems for the rest of the time. Um, okay. Blank is the process of finishing an existing hole to a specific size and required finish. Reaming. Reaming. Yeah. So your reamer um, is often called a chucking reamer, and it's going to just go through, take out that last small bit of, uh, of material in there to bring into hopefully a nice, smooth, consistently sized hole. Uh, your one thing to remember is your reamer always follows your drill. So uh, if you're if you drilled your hole crooked, your reamer will follow it. Um, so if you got a snaky hole, your reamer will it will not straighten it back out. Boring will straighten a, a janky reamed hole or a janky drilled hole out. So you could have a part, say this is the top and the bottom of the part, and you drilled your hole like this. Not sure how. Um, if you run your reamer through there, it's just going to go like that. If you're boring, you'll be able to probably straighten it back out as long as your head's straight and, all, and you fixed all your improper things that were there before. Okay. Um, true or false? Countersinking is the process of enlarging hole. Countersinking is the process of enlarging a hole cylindrically to a specific diameter and depth. Why is it false? Why is it true? Why? Countersinking has got the angle counterboring of the square hole. Cylinder. Yeah. Yeah, so your counterbore is, is a cylinder style hole that's going down through there. It has diameter and depth. Your countersink is tapered. It technically still has diameter and depth as well, um, but, it, but it is different. Did you guys go get ice cream today at Gator? No one did? I completely forgot about it when I went to lunch. I walked out of here and oh, somebody goes by. I told Loved one. It was, I told you yesterday. Oh. You missed out. Let me, let's see what else is available. Um, Thursday, no. Thursday night, Sky Lantern. I don't know what that is. Um, yes. Friday. Some fireworks that's what I think. Yeah, a little candle thing in there. That I does that. Yeah. It's on the quad at 845. Friday, um, SCGA, Student Government Association, Pizza Night and Pizza and Game Night. Anybody good at games? Really? Monopoly. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, 4 to 6 p.m. Um, next week, starting Monday, okay, so we're going to start all over again next week. Root beer floats, Gator, 11 to 1. I hate root beer, but I like the ice cream. Yeah, I'll just be like, skip the root beer, give me the ice cream. Bingo is in, uh, bingo is on Tuesday. Um, resource fair, I don't know what that is. Um, and then Thursday, there is a drawing for a gift card. I don't know. That's all I know. I want you guys to be informed. Throughout the year, there will be, more than likely, unless we get COVID crazy. And I don't think we will. We're pretty, we're pretty stable. Oftentimes, there is days, hamburgers, hot dogs, chips, and stuff. Just walk by and get them out there in the middle of the quad kind of area. It's kind of got, when you see people walking with a pile of hamburgers, um, you need to go towards the middle of the building. You need to come by and tell me, and then we need to go over to the middle of the building. All right. So it's crazy because it's all it's all you can eat. And did you know that on, also on your? I'm not trying to segue here, but um, on you, if you guys get, you might have a lunch card like a yeah. That's you know that's all you can eat. So no, like, what is it? Multiple trips or just one trip? If you're in the cafeteria, it's multiple trips. If you leave, 
it's it's just a one trip. No kidding. I would have students come here, from, they would leave cafeteria, just 14 hamburgers. Okay. I think they count now too. Like they only asked to take two sandwiches. Okay. He would come in and I would be like, dude, you are eating every one of those. I'm like, is that super wasteful? Give me one of them. And you're eating all the rest of those. I was like, that's super wasteful. And uh, and he, he would, you know. And I think he was sick after that, but he still did it. I mean, it's insane. Um, some of that food is really good. Some of it is cafeteria. So you gotta know what to do. If you do the lunch card thing, though, it's fairly cheap. If you if you get three food. bucks for ten for ten meals. Yeah, that's how much. Fifty three. Fifty three dollars for ten meals. Yeah, there you go. Pretty cheap. So, um, anyways, just trying to keep you informed about things. Campus life. Um, okay. Typical specified angle for a counter sunk hole on a fastener is what? 18 degrees. 18 degrees. That's 18 degrees included angle. <coughs> Not from the center line. Um, let's go down to 10. The, pro the machining process for spot facing and blank are the same except for the depth of the spot face hole. Counterboring. You say counterboring? Yep. Counterboring and spot facing are the exact same process. One just goes deeper. Okay, great job. <coughs> okay, let's take a look at this print because this print has a couple things that are important. And we need to start paying attention to some of these things. I'm gonna try and zoom out in um, just a smidge. Not that. Not that smidge. Okay, you've got this print as well. It's page 21 out of 40 for me. It may not be the exact thing for you. All of yours have been page 21 out of 40. Have they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to use it earlier. My, my, my. Yeah. Page 37. It's. That's why it's not matching up. That's why it's not matching up. It is page 147 for the actual page number. On this print, I think it's got a couple of things on there that are pretty valuable to, to see and to know. Um, just overall taking a look at this card, um, it's a quick, quick disconnect maybe. I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure what the part is, but it's a little coupler to something. All of these upside down triangles mean that they're critical dimensions for statistical process control, so SDC. That means those are the dimensions that we are checking every time. So if we're going to run 100 of those, we may not check every dimension every single time. We are checking those dimensions every single time. Okay, so Those would be critical dimensions for something else. So those are uh, for functionality. So one, two, three dimensions going across there. There are um, basically, most of your dimensions on there are really limit dimensions. So um, 42,000 to 38,000. So nominal would be 40,000. The nominal would be the middle of those. So nominal at 40,000. High side at 42,000. Low side at 38,000. So even this radius here as in this transition, 10 to 15,000. 341 to 345, um, so limit dimension. And now where you don't have a limit dimension is here. So we go to where to find the tolerance for this? Title block. Yes, three place decimal is plus or minus 5,000. So it's got a wider tolerance on it. Same thing here. Three place decimal, 25,000. It's got 5,000 tolerance on there. Now, all uh, radius, all inside and outside chamfers, five to ten thousandths, unless otherwise specified. Otherwise specified would be here, where it specifies ten to fifteen thousandths. So, what they're saying when they when they have something like that on the part, they expect that part to be completely bird free. 
A 5,000s radius is very, very small. I mean, think about a sheet of paper is 3,000s. So what they're asking you for, don't deliver a jagged, burred, sharp-edged part, okay? That could be done in a couple of different ways. If you're doing this on CNC, you're hopefully programming radiuses in, so you're getting all those things. You've got a part coming off the machine, you don't have to return spindle on and yank it out. If you're doing that manually, take a linear paper, clean it off, and, and go on. But what, what they're expecting is that when you pre press the shaft in or the piece in, that's not going to get hung up on something. That's a fair assumption, that you should be delivering parts to the next person, process, or customer uh, that are fur-free, that are, that are flaw-free. You know, that's what you're getting paid to do. So um, there are no surface finish marks on there. We haven't started really working with surface finish yet anyways. Um, what about this here? 095, I think is what it says, 95 thousandths. It's in parentheses. Why do you think that that's in parentheses? What do you mean millimeters if it's a three digit? Uh, that's that's a, good, it's a good assumption, but it's not that. I want to take the right hand side, like it's a, a, a hole. Yeah. Okay. That's talking about wall depth and not the depth of that propeller board, is it? Um, so no, I think it's taking, I think it's talking about the depth of the counter bore. I'm going to take a drink just to build suspense. Former. So here's where this print, this happens all the time on prints, is, is the person who's designing it has this tendency to over dimension things. So you have an overall dimension 170, right? Oh, that's just a like confusion where you came in from fusion um, where it's yes. over constrained, basically. Over -constrained. It's essentially over constrained. So what it's saying is it's got your overall length right there, right? It's got your flange. It's got a depth to this counterbore. It's got a depth from the bottom of that counterbore to this bore. And it's got a dimension from here to here. It's already dimensioned it out. It doesn't need this dimension. Because you've got overall length. You've got this dimension, this dimension, this dimension, this dimension. You don't need that there. It's a reference dimension. Uh, it should be your least looked at dimension on there. Because if you're trying to hold this dimension, you have the potential to let everything else or something else come out of tolerance. If you follow all the other dimensions, this will come into tolerance. Okay? The only place that it really is going to have an issue is if you start stretching all of these dimensions out. 170 becomes 175. Um, this becomes maybe 380, this becomes 33, sorry, 38 thousandths, this becomes 33 thousandths, and this becomes 20 thousandths. Then that might stretch out to be more than 95 thousandths. But following nominals, that should turn out to 95 thousandths on its own. It shouldn't need, um, it shouldn't need a dimension. So in CAD, in the CAD world, it'd, call, it'd be called over constraint. So, um, yeah, that's, that's important because what you don't want to do is find yourself trying to hold that dimension when it's, it's really an arbitrary dimension. So everything else should come in without it. What kind of material is that for that part? 316 stainless. 316 stainless. Okay. Um, anything else on there that we really need to know? Nope. Okay. In fact, it was called Dobby Engineering. Yeah. Dobby. That's just giving Dobby a valve cap. Dobby is free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay, here's got this has got some this has got some good stuff on it. All right, so we've got um, plate, couple countersunk holes on it, through hole, eccentric collar is what this thing is called. I don't know what it does, it doesn't matter. Or are no sharp edges on the four square corners. So some type of deburring that needs to happen on there. That B radius note added 
So we've got um, we've got a little bit of just information that is placed on there. C is two five four A to two five three A was two five four five to two five four O. So that's just helping you know what it was versus what it is now. That's helpful if you already have a program or a setup fixture to do these parts. You know you had to make some kind of change into what's happened before. So um, this is two times, so two holes, 190 through 390 by 82 degrees. So that's going to be 390 at the top of these, 82 degrees included angle going down through there. Um, that must be for like a uh, 1032 bolt or something on there. Um, this is your symbol for third angle projection. And this is three gauge or 239 hot rolled, pickled, and oiled sheet steel. If you see something that's um, hot, hot rolled, pickled, and oiled, uh, it means that when they rolled it, while it was still hot, they drop it in oil. That oil soaks up inside of there, helps keep it from rusting. On, um, I wasn't, yeah, I mean, it really kind of is for, I don't know what it does, but I don't know, probably goes on space shuttle, doubt it. Okay, talking about angles, which oh, it's like magic. You know, we just talked about angles this morning in PMI. We have angles, bevels, chamfers, tapers, and vertex. Um, I typically will tell you a chamfer on a print denotes 45 degrees, meaning that both those two sides are the same. An angle is something that is other than. Um, an angle would kind of follow the lines of bevel and taper. I think is how I would probably say it, nine times out of ten. So here it says that bevels are an angle on one surface, which makes another surface. Um, a bevel is the angle one surface makes with another surface when they are not at right angles. Again, I think that sounds a lot like an angle. Chamfers are typically going to be 45 degrees and, and placed in um, just as, a, as far as breaking an edge. Angles can be from center line, 30 degrees. These are the same angle. So 60 degrees included, 30 degrees from the center line. Okay, So you want to make sure that you know that. Uh, if you're on a lathe or something and you're making something and it's it's off center line and you're doing the included, you're going to end up going way far back or not far enough back. Your angles can be super jacked and make all your other dimensions follow suit to that. And so you want to make sure when you're working with centers or whatever it is that you're working with, standard center and 60 degree included angle. Um, here we have an angle dimension. We have a, a length and an angle. Since you have that length and that angle, you don't need to have what the diameter is here because if you know those two things, the other one's going to fall into place no matter what. If you go back an eighth of an inch, you're going to go down um, about a third of that. So here we have some um, symmetry on this one. So same thing here, 60 degree included, 30 degree from center line, two inches and two inches on the diameter there. Um, same thing for here. If, if they're the same on these two dimensions, it's automatically 45 degrees. Okay. Calculating 
or really looking at taper per foot, taper per inch, which is pretty much what we see over here. I'm not going to dive into that a ton. You guys will cover that just a little bit more in 101. You have a section on tapers. Um, but I would say it like this. 90% of the things that we work off of now are not ever listed by taper per foot or taper per inch. They're almost always by a degree to angle. It's just more accurate to do. So it might say um, across this length of 10 inches, it's got a six degree taper on it, either center line or included. So typically you're not gonna see taper per inch or taper per foot, um, partly because there's a little bit of math to figure it out and um, you can you can fix some things by changing the length of it a little bit if you start to get off somewhere so um, oftentimes you're not going to see that um see i do want to hit and i just missed it standard tapers section up here of standard tapers these are pretty important. Um, these are all, yeah, they're all uh, machine tapers. So drill presses, uh, tail stocks on the lathe, head stocks on the lathe um, are all Morris tapers. And so uh, Morris tapers is a long taper. It's got its hang on the end, a little slot, to pop that thing back out. Um, all Morris tapers. 5 eighths taper per foot, they, they stack, almost all of them stack in numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, they get larger. Jacob's taper is a little bit, um, a little bit shorter, a little more angled, it appears to be a little more angled because it's shorter. A Jacob's taper is typically on the back side of a, a drill chuck. Even a non-Jacob's chuck will have a, a, a Jacob's chuck. Brown and Sharp taper and a Jarno taper are oftentimes mixed up, especially the Jarno and the Morris taper, are oftentimes mixed up with each other. Morris taper is the standard. Jarno would be the bastard that probably you see occasionally, but it's close. And what happens is it can sit into the hole and, and it'll, it'll mate in there, but you'll have some wiggle. And what's going to happen is on a tailstock, your drill will start to, it starts to fishtail on the back. If you start to end up with a hole that's going like this in there. So you really want to make sure when you nest things in, you want to use something like Prussian blue uh, or even just some kind of bluing like a dicum that we used this morning to make sure when you bring those things in there that you get full contact on those tapers. Tapers can be a really tricky thing because a little bit of tape, a little bit of off on your taper make huge differences, especially the longer or larger that you go. Okay, Small tapers can be off uh, because they're just small area, bigger the area it gets, the more it goes. American National Standard Taper. I, mean, I don't know that I've ever, I don't know that I've ever touched anything like that. I know what it is, but I don't think I've ever taken anything with it. All those tapers are different from like our tapers on our CNC machines. These are how, this is what holds our CNC tools in the machine. These are typically cat tapers um, or BT tapers, depending on what it is, or a BT flange. Um, and the same way, they're numbered, one, two, three, four, and some of them have adapters on them, some of them won't. Um, those tapers are the things that help hold those tools in, whether it's a drill press, whether it's a tailstock, whether it's a CNC machine, whatever it happens to be. So my warning is, not to just assume that everything is always right. So a lot of times I think that students will look at the tailstock or the chuck or the tool that's going in the spindle and assume that everything's good. It's not always true. Now 99% of the time it is, but what you don't want to do is have a tool in the spindle. You started up at 10,000 RPM and it's the wrong tool, the wrong taper, and it comes out of there, okay? Rarely does anybody die, but if that's how, I mean here, when people die every day. 
Rarely does anybody die in here. Never. But I would hate for that to happen just because of a lack of checking something out. On the end of that is called a retention knob. A retention knob is the final thing that holds that tool in. It is a little collet gripper that holds that tool in. No matter how big that tool is, you can have a 12-inch face mill uh, on a 30, 40 taper. Hopefully it's bigger than that. Um, cutter spinning, 8,000 RPM. It, it, is, it is a small thing that's holding that on there. Okay, so you want to really be cautious on that. Always check those retention knobs on there. When we get to CNC, whether you're with me or Clint, um, we're, we're going to we'll always emphasize that make sure your retention knobs are on because um, you do not want to have one of those come off. If your tool starts to get out of tolerance or wobble, our CNC machines will generally tell you tool out of balance. There's a problem if it starts to wobble, but not always. So don't. When that kind of thing flies at you and like it's in, it's smashed into your head, don't go, the machine didn't say anything. You still have, we can see your brain, okay? So that still it's, doesn't change the fact that something just happened. So um, just be really cautious on stuff like that. Whether you're at the drill press with the Morse taper, uh, the, the Jacobs taper that holds the chuck in, or a tailstock, or a headstock, 5C taper, R8 collet, or whatever we have. A lot of things held in, a lot of things we do are held in by tapers. Always spend the time to double check those things. Draw bars, everything. Spend the time to double check that stuff just so that you can be safe in there. Getting a part done today versus tomorrow is not worth you doing something that is just ridiculously stupid and ending up with either you getting hurt or somebody else getting hurt, okay? So I just don't want you to, you know, I probably can't overemphasize that enough that you need to just be really, really cautious on uh, making sure that you don't have problems there. All right, so let's move into threads. And so we talked a little bit about threads this morning. Um, we talked about the crest and the root and uh, pitch. So as we look at threads, Threads are super important for us to know because we make a lot of threads. Okay, almost all of our threads are going to be 60 degrees. Um, sometimes if you have like a Whitworth thread, it'd be 55 degrees, but 90% of our threads are going to be um, in the 60 degree zone. We try to stay within a couple of different thread forms uh, just because it makes it easier and a little less cost for us. So you've got that, um, the representation of the thread, you've got the crest of the thread, that's the top part. External threads, those are OD threads. Internal threads would be ID threads. You have your lead, uh, you have your major diameter, minor diameter, so you can kind of, uh, you can't really set that up there, so crest and root, probably. Nominal pipe size, pipe thread, pitches, pitch diameter, we talked about that before. Pitch and pitch diameter are not the same thing. Pitch diameter is the midway through the thread, all the way through. Pitch is the, is the high point to high point, low point to low point. Um, midpoint to midpoint on the thread. Um, we're going to look at thread class, thread depth, thread, fo thread form, and thread series. And I've got some examples of those. Okay. So what I have here is an example of a thread, 60 degree included thread. The crest is the high side of it. The root is the low side of it. Be synonymous with major diameter and minor diameter. Okay. So Minor diameter is how deep your tool is going to cut as you're cutting across there. Major diameter is what's the outside that you're turning it to. One thing that you want to remember when you're making threads, you're never going to turn, mill, drill, ream, whatever your function is, to that standard nominal size. If you're making a half 13 OD thread bolt, you will not turn the outside of that shaft to a half of an inch. It will never go together if it is that size. So it's going to be smaller than that. So it's got to be 498, 485, probably down to 498. Four. Um, so then pitch is the midway point between these threads. Um, pitch or pitch diameter is midway point between threads. Pitch here is high point to high point, low point to low point, or midpoint to midpoint. So half 13, your lead or pitch is 76 thousandths because 
Um, essentially, it revolves about 76,000 as it goes through there. Okay. So if you're doing 20 threads per inch, your your pitch or lead is 50 because it's 50,000 every time it revolves one time through there. So um, all following on that center axis. So same thing on an internal thread. If you're doing a quarter 20 thread on, on inside, you're going to tap it. If you drill it a quarter of an inch, you've blown that hole out because you got nothing to tap anymore. So you got to be in about that 1364 or number seven drill, somewhere 201, 203, 205 would be something like that. Um, let's look at taps just so we know what we what we've got. Couple of these are loose. This is kind of janky. Student made this. Uh, do you mind know what this is? Feels like it does. I was going to say, was it the dog? Yeah, I was going to do that. Have you ever seen a screw machine? The screw machine doesn't make screws. Okay. Um, typically, it obviously does for this. Um, but a screw machine is typically a cam-driven machine. Um, multiple spindles, multiple turrets, about 50,000 things happening at once. It would make a part like this, where we might CNC turn it in a, a minute and a half, it would do it in about 12 seconds. So, uh, like, like parts fall off of one of these things like raindrops. So, I mean, they're just like, boom, falling down. Um, and so they're super fast. And so what this is, this goes in, in the turret on it, and it puts threads on it, it goes, and it, and it threads the whole outside of the thing. Freaking awesome. Like, it crashes before you knew that it crashed. So it's like, and you're like, and you're like I felt like that was fast. You know, I felt like I was right there. Um, okay, and so I've got several different um, thread-making tools on here. Um, we've got Acme threads, kind of loose, that looks like a straight pipe thread. This is a tapered pipe thread, center drill, um, kind of a long pulley style reamer. This is a thread form tap. You have spiral flute, um, you have spiral point, um, different threads for different things. Um, some that drive the chip down as it cuts, some that drive the chip up as it cuts. So if you've got a blind hole, you want the chip to come back up the tap. If you've got a through hole, then it can go on down through the bottom of the hole, no problem. Thread form tap doesn't cut material. It pushes the remainder of material into these cavities and moves it around. So we started doing some thread form uh, cutting this summer. And um, it works really good on non-ferrous materials like aluminum, brass, and bronze. So it makes a pretty slick thread in there, especially since the fact that it's not actually cutting. Uh, it looks similar to a tap, and it's just gonna push that thread down through there. So I got one up here if you wanna see it. Um, I forget, does pushing the thread then make it sturdier than cutting it because you're, you're saving yes. material? Well, you're not only saving material, but you're leaving no jagged edges. So jagged edges produce fracture points. Okay. So yeah, it's gonna push that material, so you're gonna drill it. So let's just say we're doing four to 20. Um, normally you would drill a 201, 203. You're going to drill it about 210 on this one, only leaving about 40 thousandths of, of material inside of there. That material is just going to push around, fill those gaps, and come through there. It's pretty slick how it does it, um, and that it produces such a nice thread. So, the um, amount of material you leave is going to change based on what type of material you're thread for? Yeah, what type of material and also size. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy with the ones that we did. Took us a little bit to get used to it. It also matters what kind of coolant that you use. Um, probably on you know, something like that, probably the thicker, the more, the more um, viscous. Well, I was gonna say more non-synthetic, but the viscosity of it would, would definitely help. Something on. like rapid tap or maybe something yeah, something really sticky. Something really sticky. Yeah, it's probably good for it. Yeah. Our coolant is is kind of an across the board coolant. It works really well for us, uh, but most of the stuff is that, and it's, it's free, so it helps. We've been using that. Like I said, like on a tap of thread mill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
there's no thread mill on here, but we thread mill. Yeah. I mean, the great thing about thread mill is like you can get you if your hole starts moving in size, you can adjust it. You don't have to replace the tab. So I mean, we've probably got. I bet we're pushing on one, one side more parts. I believe it. Yeah. And that new machine, we haven't changed one mill tool because we've got one side more parts on it. No kidding. As drill, machines. High speed drill on it. Yeah, we need sharpen it. Wow. As machines get tighter, better, stronger, faster, and we have cooling technology that does better, we're just not changing as many inserts and stuff. You just shouldn't have to. You just take that pass around, just kind of facilitate some of those things. Uh, the one, there's one drill on there, but that's three flute carbide drill. The great thing about a three flute carbide drill is you don't have to spot drill the whole first. You can just go with it straight through. If you need a chamfer, you're still going to have to do it. But. Um, so threading is going to be a big part of what we do or have done. Um, is every 101 in PMI? Yes. So um, there'll be a couple of things that, that you guys haven't talked about that we've talked about, but you will catch it up if you haven't already if you haven't already caught it. So what is PMI? Precision measuring instruments. It's a NC3 certification that we're doing in our 101 class. We just just started it this semester. Um, actually, that's not true. I ran it this summer with another student. But so it'll be for all of our future students or students who have not taken tech math. Tech math. We're gonna we're gonna eventually embed it into tech math. We want to work the bugs out of it here because it's primarily for machining. But we also want our automotive students, our welding students, our IEM students to go through it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's it's a high view over measuring tools, and then AMI, which is advanced manufacturing advanced measuring tools, that'll happen specifically here in another course at another time. Yeah, that's all over my 101. It it was in nobody's 101 until now, and I just pulled my 135 students back. They're probably hating it. So I was like, y'all are going through PMI this semester, and they're like. I was like, you are, but we're going to do this first. So, um, just because I think it's important for them to have some of those things, um, it's just good. It's going to be good for them. Uh, it's it's kind of owned by Snap-on and Steric. I won't say owned, but they're kind of your primary people that take care of it. All the tooling for it um, is Snap-on or Steric. So you're you're kind of always doing a commercial for them. Um, but there, there's some pretty good information. In all right, so a couple of different ways of looking at threads. Again, so root and crest, same thing, just reverse on an internal thread. Um, all thread designations. So um, probably more, since we're in the camp world and CAD world, we talked about this yesterday, you're seeing more of stuff like this, but all three of these are really telling you that they're all going to be threads on a part. So we have anything from... Let's see, let's do, I'm going to come down here and try to find, here we go. So I'm going to go down and then back up. Um, this thread right here is a 3 quarter 10 unified national course 2A. Okay, so what that means is the outside of it is 3 quarters of an inch nominal, 10 threads per inch. So if you take your pitch gauges that we looked at in PMI this morning, uh, you take your 10, you stick it in there, it should fit in there. Unified national course, and so it's either a coarse thread, fine thread, or an extra fine thread. Two is the class of fit. A means that it's external. So B would mean that it is internal thread. And so I'm going to go backwards, back up here. Yeah, that's one cap. Yeah. Okay. So. Standard 60 degree threads. You have your coarse threads and your fine threads. Um, it's just the amount of threads that go on the part. And there's several different reasons why you would have coarse threads or fine threads. The finer the thread, the more holding power because there's more material that's eaten up in that area. Coarse threads definitely have an, a, a place, they thread on faster. And they also won't have as much load going up against them. Okay, so uh, good fastener is going to hold a lot of area, but your fine thread is what's really going to hold tightly to something. Um, you also have an extra fine thread that's going to give you just 
um, a little bit more um, grip on there. Constant thread pitches. Um, so you have these threads per inch is what we're talking about when we're talking about a constant thread pitch. That means in every inch there's eight threads, there's 16 threads, there's 20 threads, there's 24 threads, there's three threads, whatever it might happen to be. Thread class, so that one that we looked at a second ago that was a three quarters in, that was a 2A. That class indicates, in, one indicates a loose fit um, for easy assembly disassembly. Class two indicates closer tolerance. Class three is something that has no shake in it. So when you screw that nut on there, there's no wobble in there. So like one is when you're at home and you have to uh, make an emergency bolt, um, that's probably a one. Okay, so like you had to tap a hole, you had a bolt or or you had a, a piece of drill rod that was three eighths, and you're like, I need a three eighths bolt. You take a die nut, go around it just real quick in a hurry. It's kind of crooked. It goes in, but it's not the best. Um, you wouldn't want to trust, you know, you wouldn't want to fly with it. Um, so that's kind of a one. Two is just kind of that middle of the road. Two is probably your Westlake's hardware nut bolt. Um, and then three becomes your real precision smooth fit on there. Okay, so it's got. Uh, a micrometer, probably a micrometer is probably a, a tighter fit than that. But to just give you an idea of class of fit there. Okay, so we have three quarters of an inch, 10 threads per inch, unified natural course, two, and then A. Um, this one, let's take a look at just this. Number of starts. Typically, a thread or a screw has a consistent thread that runs down through it. 10 threads per inch, 20 threads per inch, whatever it might have to be. Multiple starts means that there is another set of threads on within inside of those threads. So um, you could have a two start thread or a double lead thread. So if you look at the end of it, you can see the thread start here and you see the thread start here. Advantage is that it spins faster on there. So, um, I was like soda bottle. Soda bottle. It's exactly what I was looking for. Was somebody's water bottle, soda bottle, you back there with your bottle is probably a double lead thread. Because who in the world would make an American have to screw all those five threads? You know, if you can do it in half the amount of time, it makes sense. It also makes sense because there's not as much load on there, right? So if you need something to travel down a rod or a screw really fast, you start to multi-lead that thread. Okay, so if I need to go down, um, so it used to go down, takes two minutes to get down all the way down the shaft, I need to increase that, uh, but I don't have much load on it. If it takes 10 minutes, I need to do it in five, I can double lead it. If I need to go um, faster than that, triple lead, four leads, five leads, you can have I think I've seen up to nine sets of threads on a shaft. That's, that's a busy screw right there. I mean, that's like your old alpha legs or that um, whatever one that's across from that alpha. Um, it probably has set up in it. I know the alphas have up to nine, nine leads on their on the threads. So um, they would just they would continue to just be opposites from each other as much as they can be. Uh, you'll get increasingly fast speed going down there. The more you start to lay that thread out though, the, the less strong it happens to be. Okay, so if you're looking for a real good strong thread, that's not your that's not your thread. So I saw a while ago like an internet meme of somebody who I think combined left hand and right handed threads on a single piece. It's awesome. So that's kind of the same thing. I thought about making it. John Gallo who bring my bolts in tomorrow. You got something to do that? Left and right hand threads. Right three kind of okay. Um, yeah, probably same thing. Kind of like a neural almost. Yeah. Yeah. It's real heavy. Yeah. Bring it in tomorrow. That'd be a good idea. So John Gallo in our morning class had one that's very similar to it. It's neural on the outside, and you can almost set the bolt down on it, and it'll screw itself in. Yeah. But there, you're supposed to be able to do it either way. Yeah, you should do it left handed or right handed. I'm not sure what kind of witchcraft makes that happen. I have not looked at it enough, but it does make sense. You've got a. I don't know what you'd use it for. I don't know what you'd use. I think uh, something to put on your desk. Yeah, you know? that's what's out of my toolbox. Yeah. I was, yeah. Say, if you knew, I was wondering, like, 
And I know when you're running the lathe, if you start it, uh, right, you have to start on the same, I think it's a letter dial on the lathe itself. So yeah, you've got your lead nut, or your half yeah. nut that you're gonna engage into the same number every time. Right, yeah. and with, if you were making something like that, I assume that when you start doing your left hand thread, you wanna engage on the same one almost, or would that interval, would that then just no, you would still engage on the same one, but you're gonna you're gonna be going in the other direction. Yeah, with that. So so same lead, um, same pitch to just it, different just different direction on it. Yeah. So a lot of times you're gonna go upside down or whatever, depending on how your tool configuration is. But yeah, you're gonna make the reverse thread of that, which is super cool. I mean, yeah, I saw that one day and I was like, man, I'm gonna. <laughs> you know, I mean, I just, yeah, I just know me, you know, I mean, I would love to have it, but I, I probably won't take the time to make it. It would have space. Yeah, it would, but it would be cool to have, but it is really cool. Um, okay, let's look at um, tapered threads. So tapered threads are typically called pipe threads or MPT, um, but not always. You can have still have a pipe thread that's straight. Um, 1.78 is the taper that you're going to have for that on the center line. And the idea is, it's often called a dry seal um, pipe thread, because the idea is that you're going to screw that into it, and it's going to dig those threads into it, and then it's going to it's going to be a, a watertight seal. And not that you're not going to put pipe dough or Teflon on it or something to get it clamped down together, but the idea is that it's locking down into it. Two different ways to make a pipe thread: you can turn it straight and just taper the threads, or you can taper the end of the shaft and then taper the threads. I think I, I think you probably find myself happy in either category, depending on what it is that I'm making. So MPT would tell you that typically it's a, a national pipe thread. Um, gosh, I felt like there was something else I wanted to say about threading. Let's look at a couple of these questions. The blank is the distance from a point on a thread to the corresponding point on the next thread measured parallel to the thread's axis. Pitch. Okay. High point to high point, low point to low point, mid point to mid point. Re blank representation is a method of representing threads on a drawing using hanging lines to represent um, straight and tapered to figure threads. True or false, national, the American national thread form replaced the unified form and is most common today. False. Is that false? Like, I think it's false, or you're reading it? I'm not over there yet. Um, yeah, I, off the top of my head, I don't know. If you see it in there, I trust you. I don't think it replaces it because in the summary it says there's two types. The two common thread forms in the United States is the unified American national form. Okay. Uh, it's on page 31 under thread forms. It says uh, uh, two common threads or two common thread forms, blah, blah, blah. The unified thread form replaced the older American national form and is most common today. Yeah. Okay. Course threads are specified with what designation? Yep, unified national course. True or false, fine threads have fewer threads per inch than coarse threads. False, they have more threads. Class blank indicates a loose fit for easy assembly. Yep, D1. Um, true or false, um, the letter A following a fit designation X indicates external thread. True. B is internal, A is external. Uh, which of the following is not included in the standard thread notes? Direction of threads. Mm. So direction of threads is usually an assumption. Unless it says left hand, it's, it's assumed right hand. Um, minor diameter is also not included into it. So. If you know the major diameter and you know the threads per inch, you should have enough information to figure out pitch, minor, everything else. So, like when we when you say, 
I need a 5 8 11 bolt. You you know it's 5 8 and it's 5 8 it's 11 threads. The rest of it starts to kind of fall together. Um, let's do the last one. True false. Two common types of na American National Standard pipe threads are tapered and straight. True. Yeah. So you have your straight pipe threads and you have your tapered pipe threads. Okay. It's almost three o'clock. Um, let's see. We have. I think there's. Is there two more units? Thirteen and fifteen, maybe, or twelve, maybe twelve, thirteen, fifteen. Let me jump in here. Eleven. So let's see. That actually puts us in a pretty good spot for today. All right, we're gonna stop there. Um, here's what I want you to do. Yesterday we talked a little bit about micrometers. I'm going to give you this. I want you to bring this back to me tomorrow. Those are both standard micrometers. Those are inch micrometers. Okay. Take your time. Work those over this evening. Bring them back tomorrow. That way we can continue to spend our first week getting really confident with measuring tools and some other things. A lot of that stuff will still happen as we go. Um, no one's asking you to be an expert with it today, but we want to get better as we go. Okay, other than that, um, I believe that you are free to go. If you have any questions, you're welcome to stay. I will be here. Too. All right, you're good to go, other than that. If you got a laptop, um, please put it back up and put it on a charger. Um, yeah, and the point five of module, yeah, yeah. There's not very many. It's just like, um, let me jump in there and I'll look at it. Yeah, a lot of them are some of those things that we do every semester. Safety, you know, yeah, yeah, print reading, just some real simple stuff. Yeah, all of those things in immersive just need to be done Sunday, 11:59. All I need is, is it done by here. So even if it doesn't have like a shutoff date, all of immersive, all of that immersive needs to be done by 11:59. What about the immersive one? Yes. 101 immersive you're not worried about yet so you're going to start on those you'll actually start on those next week okay cool